Not again, not again, not again. Hello and welcome to the Exploding Appendix podcast. In today's episode, I have the real honour of talking to Aiko Otake and William Johnston about this really powerful and moving book, A Body in Fukushima. Um, so it's a collection of um, dance or movement photography, which Aiko performs in abandoned spaces in Fukushima following the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown. Um, Eiko Otake is a movement-based artist who's been working since the 70s um, and really pioneering a lot of kind of movement work. I'm most famously known for her work with Eiko and Coma. And William Johnston is a historian and photographer and really brings some really interesting insights, historical insights into his approach to photography. So it's a real pleasure to talk to both of them about this. The session was recorded as part of the Exploding Appendix Avant-Garde Art Practice and Research Group who meet regularly to explore ideas of avant-garde art, radical counterculture, and other areas that sort of generally fall within that remit. Um, the sessions are free and open to all. So if you would like to get involved, send me a message at explodingappendix at gmail.com or follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, or Twitter, or check out our website at www.explodingappendix.com. And that's all I've got to say for now, so over to the group. Well, thank you both for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you here. This night is our Exploding Appendix night. I mean, it's called Exploding Appendix partly because it relates to this idea of the appendix at the back of the book and the idea that, you know, these kind of fragments are sort of growing. Oh, I, point, I also kind of liked the idea that something that was potentially useless could be transformed into something potentially dangerous. So those are some of the ideas that the project originates from. We do some projects outside of this, but this has been a way to usually sort of meet and kind of keep up, keep together. We used to meet in the pub and now we've sort of been working for, for about oh. eight months. So we've been meeting online. I see. That's nice. Yeah, that's great. That sounds very European. It's very European. It's something we would both enjoy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we just all what we need is a Guinness. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was one of the good things about going to the pub because you could have a drink and you could just sort of relax and chat with people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a bit. It's been a bit different um, uh, since then. Mm-hmm. Um, it, one of the good things about going online is that we just get to talk to people from anywhere, really. So right. That, that has been one of the pluses, really. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, this wonderful book. So, yeah, you were saying it's about 10 years since um, the actual disaster. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so this, is, this is the wonderful book. It's really beautiful and really powerful and very moving. I found it very touching. Actually, there's a lot of stuff in it that... Um... <laughs> oh, I did love that little, that little detail of your signatures on it. It's really lovely. But yeah, these, these sort of really, I think they're very powerful pictures. I just think the fact that they're really exploring the space and this, the, you know, this is a space which has been deserted, people aren't there, but then there's you moving within those spaces. It feels very powerful. It feels very touching and, and very moving at points and very subtly moving at points. I just find it very sort of powerful to just sort of think about what was going on there. And also just to think about what your process was. So that's one of the things I think would be really kind of... Um, your experiences, your thoughts on this. And there's, a really, there's some really beautiful pieces that kind of, beautiful <clears throat> pieces of writing that kind of accompany it. And some so also very useful historical kind of references within it. So it's quite, a, it's quite an eclectic book, I think, but it's also a book that really explores its subject matter. I know, Aiko, you've been sort of doing some, you've been dancing for quite a long time, well, since the 70s, right? Moving. Well, I started 70, 1972. Mm. Oh, yes, that's nearly, you figure, 40, nearly 40, oh, no, nearly 50 years, right? Yeah, nearly yeah. 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, almost my all, all, all you, Yeah, you bring something in the performances and the emotion that sort of seems to come from the performances. I just found it really, really moving, actually. The way you're approaching it is really, really powerful and beautiful. And the, the photography itself is also is really beautifully framed and really capturing this this landscape which I think is also really interesting it's really responding to that that area really and what has gone on there it's just very nice to look in 
But this is nice to see a yeah. book as book. As exactly. Book, just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rather than images of, yeah. from the book. And it also shares with the people who have joined today for the first time to see this. Right? Yeah. So anytime, Bill, I mean, you had a perspective of a viewer, a photographer, and historian. So you are absolutely welcome to kind of start talking to the India address. Well, you know, one, one thing, I mean, one question that you raised here, and, and it really is sort of the starting point of the book and a lot of the themes that we're dealing with in the book, including the historical dimensions, um, is you, you, you asked us a question about, you know, our teaching a course on Japan and the atomic bomb. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's how we got to know each other originally. Um, that it was 2005, mm -hmm. I think that um, I was invited to come to a lunch at the university I, I'm at, Wesleyan University. <laughs> Formers to come work with you know, regular classroom sort of type uh, situations. So, you know, myself being a historian, but there were also people in the natural sciences, for example, etc. cetera. Um, and I was asked to come to this lunch. And then when I realized, you know, I was, I was told Eiko Otake, and I didn't know Eiko's last name. But I knew Eiko and Koma. <laughs> so she walked in and I said, oh, you're Eiko and Koma, Eiko. She goes like, yeah. I said, oh, well, I know you're working. We have common, friends in common, actually. And what are you working on? And she said, well, I'm working on a translation um, of a book called From Trinity to Trinity. And the Trinity refers to the Trinity um, explosion of the first atomic uh, bomb in the world in uh, I want to say July 16th, I think July that's 16, right, yeah. um, 1945, over the desert in, in um, uh, uh, New Mexico. And it's that Trinity site, and it's by Hayashi Kyoko, uh, one of the survivor of the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the Nagasaki bomb. And Eiko was translating that. And so I said, oh, well, what about doing a course on, on Japan and the atomic bomb together? That was something I'd been thinking about. And she said, yeah, sure, let's do that. So that's how we got to know each other. And we taught that course together, you know, two or three times before the uh, March 11th incidents. And he, you know, as he mentioned, is Kyoko Hayashi, a very important friend of mine that I have become friends intentionally once I read his book, um, once I read her book and decided to translate. And then I really pushed myself you know, because it wasn't like we, we don't live anywhere close. We are different in age, we are different in a, a, a background. But I had a very strong feeling of wanting to, to get to know her more, more than just by book. And she, she was very forthcoming as well. And we literally became a very close friends. Well, she, she was wonderful because you would have our students as one of their assignments, yeah. right? Write um, a, letter to, a letter to Hayashi. Right. And to translate. You would translate, and then she would actually read them and, and sometimes wrote back, I believe. Right, exactly. So, again, you know, depending on how my translation is, but I do feel very strongly, you know, when you know a victim historically and under this really massive violence, continue. Once she started, she continued to write, right? Now, her name. And I actually address her in this book. So one of my essay actually takes a shape of me writing to her after she's dead. In a way of, I am letting world, my student, my readers of this book or any of my performances by quoting her, but quoting my calling her name, addressing her. What I'm trying to say here is it's not just me and Bill seeing the, what happened in Fukushima. I am almost borrowing her eyes, her mind. You know, that you can do that with your friends. You know, I mean, when some of your close friends die or your family member die, you continue to talk to that person because you kind of know that person and you can construct from your memory and from your imagination how she would be seeing the world. And so I, I continue to have that conversation, right? So in a way, it's not, you know, me and Bear just going to Fukushima. And then there are people that we meet in Fukushima. So what I'm trying to say is it's not just one direction of me just watching Fukushima. There are so many important people <coughs> at the web of relationship and history from my childhood, you know, my relationship to Japan, my, it's a country that I grew up with. So there are many dimensions that makes not just I'm looking at a subject, 
I'm looking at the subject with this multidimensional sense of takake. It's, it's an area, you know, one, mm. I'm not looking, if I'm looking at you, it's just one line, right? But Fukushima is not a small place. And I also have those relationships. I have my memories. I have my political thoughts. I have my scares, you know, I'm being scared. All that weaves into this series of work we have done. And it changes, you know, that element changes throughout that collaboration and throughout how we see that the scenes change. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's, it's on the one hand, it's a very personal piece of work, but it's also yes. historical and sort of socially. Yes. Uh, I like to weave that. You know, I think both of us like to weave. We really bring that, you know, he's a scholar, so he usually doesn't write in a way of I, I mm. yeah. So this is very much weaving his historian self, yet a personal self, which yeah. I think I kind of, so like, we do this together. Well, it's, it's what you point out. It's, in a sense, part of your duet project. Yes, it is. We yeah. are doing a duet, but I'm also duetting with Hayashi, <clears throat> Hayashi san. I'm also duetting with Fukushima Landscape. Or well, sometimes I just duet with a tree that is behind it. Right? So that duet has the way to capture the moment. So I'm not having experience of dancing in an empty stage. It's always kind of in a relationship with. Mm, yeah, well, I really like that, that part. And, mm. I now realize it's probably that is also why it hurts me so much. In well, another way, I'm not just using this tree as my background. Mm. I am feeding the tree and that's my practice, right? I don't pretend to be a tree, but I try to change my uh, distance to the tree by, by having the kinesthetic. And I, if you start to be a little closer to be a tree, it helps you to look back the time how tree has seen the change. And I even feel more, you know, more tension, more regret of having seen it. It seems like the way you approach dance is very much like, it's very much, a, an inter it's a very internal process. It's not necessarily a, an external process or necessarily an artificial process. It's simply, you know, outside of you. It's all, it, a lot of it seems to come very much from within you or you feeling your environment internally, as it were. You know, any art piece, you know, any work that is created by artists has an external shape, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's being a novel, whether it's being a photograph or the dance. But I think it is an internal, things that fills and sometimes sweeps out of that external lines that makes a reaching to the people. And this one is definitely we are reaching. We're not putting our photos in our closet to our own satisfaction. We are putting it in a form of available for you and for other viewers. So I'm very delighted you invited me for this intimate meeting because that was a kind of nice surprise to hear, oh, an email from England. <laughs> <laughs> Exploding appendix, no less. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how did you, how did it hit to your search web? What's that, sorry? How did you even came across, even before? Uh, so I was researching for a project called Disrupted Rhythms, which is a which is a kind of dance project that I'm working on. And, mm. and in some ways it's kind of similar, like we're doing, um, so we've sort of, the idea of disruptive rhythms was partly because we've been through lockdowns and stuff. So rhythms was kind of just being disrupted. And I've been reading Ev's rhythm analysis book. I don't know if you, right. that, but I was kind of really inspired by this, the way he would approach rhythm from everything from like the body to like, you know, people walking down the streets to how a particular political system would work and mm. so explore rhythm in a kind of broader sort of way. And so um, that I was at the same time, I was just meeting with a big group of people just to move and dance. So it just became a way of um, partly having a bit of a release. And then slowly that's turned into a project which has got 
we're both recording it and we're also photog photographing it and I'm writing some essays to accompany it. Mm. It's all become a kind of multi-level project. But because I was exploring that, I was kind of looking for dance photography. Mm. Oh. And so as I was searching, and I, I think I came across the book first on, like, I think I'm maybe on Amazon or something, but I, I came across the book and I was like, oh, this looks, this looks amazing. And then, then, I, then I came went and looked at your, your, um, your websites and I was like, oh, I really want to, yeah, I'd really love to interview you. And then that's where it sort of all came from, really. Thank you. You know, I'm not unfamiliar with a certain older dance audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Koma and I, you know, what, what's how formally I worked with as Eric and Koma. Koma was my partner. Koma is still my partner, mm -hmm. but you know, we are not working together anymore. So Eric and Koma had performed in Dance Umbrella in London, mm -hmm. probably at least three times, if not more. The Place Theatre, yeah. we performed there. Um, I also performed in Wales. So, and I, I do believe we went to the uh, Cambridge too. So. Oh. So, you know, it's like, but I haven't, I haven't been to your country for a good 10 years, if not. Mm. So it is very nice to be brought back. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so I actually, I will go to the first, my first question, which was sort of expanding on that, because because I was sort of exploring sort of disrupted rhythms. I was sort of, when I read this book, I also thought it was in some ways also about sort of rhythms being disrupted, because yeah. um, you also, in the preface, you sort of just, just you talk about sort of disrupted landscapes. Yes. Um, um, and um, Aiko, you also sort of talk about sort of train stations and the way that they seem to sort of disrupt or sort of break up a journey. Yeah. I was sort of wondering the way, um, in what ways do ideas around disruption sort of permeate this project? I mean, this is great because that's exactly what Biro <laughs> writes and talks about. But mm -hmm. on my end, even before in the year 2011 itself, that the first time I went, right? This is like five months after the meltdowns, I went to Fukushima without bill. Mm. Okay, the train station. Usually it's not a very active train line, but it is an important train line for the people who live there, right? That region, right? Train is not coming. That's disruption, right? Train is not coming. Well, so it's it's school, it's it's shopping, it's you know work. There's just so many things. It's it's part of everyday life with regular rhythm. And nuclear plants itself, in in the in the world before, it had a rhythm of operations, right? And of course, it's completely destroyed because that rhythm of operation is bound to stop at certain point. It's never going to continue, right? I mean, even our breathing system, once we are born, it's going to end at a certain point. So I'm kind of looking at it, this whole disruption as quite unbelievable, at the same time, completely believable. In fact, it's inevitable. So I'm not saying, oh, this got disrupted and I am being hurt by this. We humans are hurt, environment is hurt. At the same time, it was a huge mistake to have even thought this will continue. Just as it's wrong for us to think, oh, we'll be fine another 150 years. That's that's just not possible, right? So I'm kind of looking at this in a two different lens of seeing the social, political, you know, moral, ethics of hurting so much was a greed and for the advancement of technology and to supply more, uh, more electricity. At the same time, everything we make breaks down. So I'm also witnessing and I'm learning more about that inevitability of breaking down. And, and, and for me, it's, it's very much you know, this sort of what um, layering of, of so-called natural systems in a sense. I mean, in, in a way, there's nothing that's, that's, you know, I don't see that humans as separated from nature. But at the same time, we've created systems which no longer depend on, you know, the turning of the sun, for example, right? We, we want light all the time. Right. And because of that demand for that light all the time, I'm sure it's good in many, many ways. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's no question about that. Um, but at the same time, when we assume that 
you know, the, which is the, the, the mode of capitalist systems is that growth is necessary and can be infinite. Um, when, when we live in a, a very closed system, I mean, you know, how do you have infinite growth in a closed system? It doesn't work. Um, but people don't want to face that reality. And nuclear energy is a way of sort of stepping into that and looking how, oh, look, out of this little bit of matter, we can have this tremendous amount of energy coming out. And this is the kind of language that they used in the 1940s. I mean, even at the same time they're developing nuclear weapons, they're, they're already thinking, okay, we can use this energy for making electricity and, and just you know, all kinds of powering things. I mean, the idea of nuclear airplanes was a really big one for a long time. You know, how do we use you know, nuclear power to, to get aircraft into the air? Um, and you know, what this, this, you know, the 311 incidents really bring home is yet again, unfortunately the what happens with the collapse of that system and when something breaks and there's there's a wonderful book um, called normal accidents um, by somebody named charles perro um, he, he wrote it in 1983 i believe it was originally um, it's still in print it's still completely relevant and he points out that there are, are things which you know with complex systems inevitably are going to break and yet there are some things that when they break the consequences are so dire that we should just let, relinquish those systems completely. Um, and nuclear power is one of those for me. I mean, you ask in a later question, what do I think of nuclear power? Um, but that's really where it is. And for me, stepping into Fukushima and, and using the visual imagery and then Eiko interacting with this environment this way are ways of expressing those layers of ideas. You know, the, I know the Japanese company Mitsubishi, I believe, was actually um, contracted to uh, uh, build another nuclear plant in England, mm -hmm. right? And oh. after that, you know, they had to pull out because then they realized all oh, the cost of <laughs> when the inevitable at certain point happens, it just doesn't make sense, even from their point of capitalist point of view. So in a way, that disruption also brings an awareness yeah. And I think this is this is part of important. It's like it's not just a fight of the ethics. It's more like literally talking into the dollar value, the money value, and the way it's how it makes any sense at all, right? So in a way, the, the, some of the, the ongoing projects, like in Taiwan, they were about to build the third, uh, uh, third reactors, and they kind of completely stopped it, right? So this is a way that some of the things get completely disrupted but we have a capacity to understand it. That was inevitable. And I think that part is, I'm kind of hopeful in a way. Mm. There's the level in which um, disruption is kind of inevitable, but also we can understand different types of disruption. And the more we understand them, there's the, well, there's two ways that you can sort of ignore different types of disruption, or you can, or there could be a process of, of understanding. And then at that point, you're right. Yes, ignoring our self-denying is definitely an option, yeah. right? And because self-denial is so much a tendency that we humans have. So I think as an artist, I really don't fancy, oh, we'll have a big power to, you know, let other people to change the mind. But I think for those minds that tend to close up, I think there is a possibility, just eye open, you know, the, the sigh. Ah, comes out and there's a way to get a little bit of awareness of kind of closing mind to let it every day go by again so i'm kind of hoping that is part of that yeah what did other people think of the images that i showed if you have any questions about specific images please ask too yeah oh that's beautiful isn't it can you just go back to the first big wave image i want to talk to you about yeah. that yeah, so this monk was actually a learning lesson. I'm not at all like, you know, the adventure seeker. I have a pretty <laughs> timid mind, okay? <laughs> so here, I wasn't really going to that wave. This could have killed me, actually. Mm. Wow. I was measuring it at that point, you know, the wave was coming between my knee and the thigh. Okay, no more, really. I, I was very... I was very clear that well, I was in a safe place. We're, we're, we're standing on this, this rock out in the middle of the Pacific, basically. It's, it's just sticking way out there. And I'm watching the edge and watching waves and you know, telling Eiko, okay, don't go further than that. 
And I'm also, you know, was at this point, we're getting nervous saying, Eiko, come in this way. But I thought, because I was pretty careful, you know, like well, if you are there for 10 minutes, you kind of see the average of the way, right? And this one actually came to my mind, it was the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I didn't see it coming. Right, so like, this was like, oh my God, this, you know, we were not in a rough day of any source and that place, I didn't go into this danger. So this really showed me, you know, every nuclear plant need water, right? So usually by the water place. Mm -hmm. And of course, Japan is known for earthquakes. There's not a day passes by, or at least a week passes by without some kind of a, you know, felt or fe not felt. But usually like every year we have completely feelable earthquake, right? So you put those things together and realizing, oh, so the knowability is not just how the body knows. This, this wave surprised me. And if I was hit back, I could have taken, right? I was lucky because I was, I fell in front and grabbed a, a, a part of the rock. So they really kind of, I, I learned from this experience. I can't quite trust my observation. Mm. You know, I mean, my observation has a certain experiential knowledge in it. And there is, there is, there is a more, more range. And the more range is a part of the nature. And so this was, I had a lot to think about myself. Well, and, and I think it's a lesson for all of us. Yes, 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 yes. So that, that's why one of the reasons why this, this piece is there, because it reminds all of us and I always wanted to use this opportunity. I am not a danger seekers person. It's not like that. It's not a point of me how courageous I am. That's almost the opposite of my running experience. Sorry to interrupt you. When you say you didn't expect that wave, it's interesting for me because the Japanese government might make the same excuse, right? Yes, <laughs> you, absolutely. Yeah, but you said absolutely. that there's. Difference I'm talking about here is this looks like a normal day, and I'm telling you, there's not a thing called normal day that nothing can happen. Yeah. You know, like, you know, in Florida, we just, the whole building, half of the building collapsed, right? Now you look back, there was a warning sign, there was a negligence, but we don't know what the people who are sleeping there, you know, that night, right? So I was that person. <laughs> You know, I was falsely thinking I'm safe because I am actually using my own decision making and observation, right? But the way that Japanese government and TEPCO basically said, now it's proven they were actually dying. Mm. Okay, when this happened, I did not know. But you know, now anyone who read certain uh, uh, history and the uh, material that came out and out of the uh, lawsuit that is happening in many ways is now clear. There was a lots of lots of warning um, from the, the even the people from the within and the company. So it was it was actually willfully ignored, which is the negligence. It, it's a professional negligence, but it's actually not even forgetfulness. They were actually they decided not to look at it. Mm. It's part of what's happened in Florida, looks like, you know, and just only we are now trying to we are finding out. And this is a I wouldn't use the word interesting, but it's a chilling part of, like sometimes it was five days later, sometimes five years later, we find out what we did not know before. This is where the, the knowledge becomes extremely important for us to understand the core, the mm -hmm. core of the nature of the event. I'm kind of sitting quiet with a historian. I shouldn't be preaching this, but. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted as a historian when somebody else is saying how important history is. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm definitely not a great student of this, but having dealt with uh, uh, Fukushima, I have really learned this. There are so much that has been willfully ignored. It means we have to be proactive uncovering it, right? Yeah. Even if I don't have a capacity to understand or to dig out my own fact, at least I can go against the uncovering. I mean, uh, 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 covering. Covered. Yeah, covering. Yeah, that's. And I knew that there was. Um, I knew that there had there's been tidal wave issues in Japan historically and not too irregularly, but I didn't know that you had regular earthquakes, large ones. Oh yeah. 
we, I, pro, I would not say probably the most, but I can tell you easily, Japan is probably the most frequent, one of the most wow. frequent. It's, it's generally called the Ring of Fire, which is mm -hmm. the, the area all the way around the Pacific oh, Ocean. Yeah. So Japan being the um, sort of western edge of that in California, in the United States, uh, Alaska, Canada, um, Mexico, and then down to Chile um, is you know sort of a whole other part of it, and then down to um, New Zealand and and up you know through through Indonesia and all, and mm -hmm. that whole area is extremely earthquake prone and volcano prone, um, and as a consequence, tsunami the 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 waves you know are are huge, and like there have been ones which earthquakes happen off Chile, resulting in in tsunami in Japan. Mm -hmm. And of I course. Those information was readily available for those who wants to look at it. So even before the nuclear plant had been built, this is not an unknown fact, you know, this is a clearly unknown fact about this particular landscape and particular region. Yeah, I don't I I, I don't know too much about it. I should know more really because I studied environmental studies. Hmm. But I know that loads of loads of people were really angry all of the first world countries were angry um about it you know and the um the kind of um global first world environmental meetings i know that there was a lot of anger in those circles because they um there was science ignored and did you know people personally from fukushima did you well, no, not that I knew the people before, but because we went there for five times. So by fifth time, we are meeting people who came back. Mm. Yeah, that is a very um, a, a limited percentage of the people who came back, yeah. of people without the young children. And, and they came up for different reasons, you know, such as your family, the grave, it's, you know, maybe you want to help, so, you know, mm. like a, a long run of the recovery of the area. Or like, you know, they would rather be where you have always been when you're in a certain, yeah, home. You know? So there are kind of individual decisions making. And then within the Fukushima of that area, it's not very even, you know, the, the radiation changes depending on the landscape, you know, if it's a mountain here, here's a river here, how much of the rain, yeah. all those things. So there are a bunch of people now who are actually examining themselves, not trusting government data. They're actually regularly Mm -hmm. Measures radiation themselves mm -hmm. and continue yeah. to be there with their own finding. I saw a documentary where they were. There are some. There are. I don't know if it. it what's it called? Is it backdoor tourism where they bring people into Fukushima and Chernobyl? Oh and I saw, yeah. I saw a documentary where one day um, the government had had de um, declared the space safe enough for visiting, but yeah. they took their own radiation with them. And it was something like a ten thousand percent concentration, right. something insane, right. uh, way over, way over. Um, and it was a particularly windy day that day. But still, the discrepancy between the government information and what they were showing was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And like I yeah. we regularly observe, you know, there are lots of radiation uh, measuring uh, device all over the area, right? Yeah, those but it's yeah. like those measures, like big ones, right? But it's usually like higher than my head. Mm. So when you are that, you know, that high from the ground, it's really not measuring correctly because, you know, single spiral up, right? So if we are like right on the ground with the dirt and, yeah. you know, uh, fallen leaves, that's much, much higher there, right? So that was very clear sign of Okay, those measurement is really not wanting to measure the danger. It is just mm. there, or because it is politically, mm. politically motivated. Wow. It's very sad. And I also want to tell you, because you mentioned Chernobyl, I, we met the people who had gone to study Chernobyl, mm -hmm. because they felt like, again, in the same relationship, of we can't really trust what Japanese government are saying, what TEPCO is saying. So they actually said, oh, who can tell us? what will be happening in 20, 30, 40 years from now. So they went to Chernobyl and the people just kept learning from their own experiences, right? And I think that's amazing mm -hmm. how often the victims, which was also true with the atomic bomb victims, the first thing they learn, sadly, very sadly, 
is I cannot trust the power. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So they had to become yeah. much smarter. They had to be on their own person, you know, learning their own possible ways, even though that is limited. Well, grassroots organization. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So that was that part was actually I was very touched. You know that there are some inn we stayed and those man and wife are back to 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 operate this inn. They measure everything that they buy before they cook. You know for the guest. Yeah. Oh, of course. So I think we are creating this new kind of aware aware people. How dangerous was it to shoot these photographs, and what precautions did you take? The main thing we did was we stayed for the most part in areas which were considered safe um, for short-term visits. So for example, this place you were looking at in this image, uh, in fact, after our very first day of, of solid shooting um, when we got there, um, but these places are all places where there were workers. I mean, people who, they, they couldn't stay overnight. They were told not to but they could come in and do things during the day. And so for the most part, we stayed to those places. Um, we did explore a couple of, of places where we snuck in um, and we did have a dosometer with us and I was checking along the way to see, okay, how, how radioactive is this? Um, it wasn't a worry for myself, but I was worried about Eiko because like in this image, she's on the ground um, or sometimes even with her feet in water, you know, that, that she would be standing in water, which is much more highly radioactive. And so that's one reason as well. We went twice in 2014, but just consciously said, we can't go back in 2015. We've got to give Eiko's body a break here. So in another way, we want that careful, but we want that adventure season, somewhere in between. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and also feeling that, you know, we're not, we're not that... Um, I mean, we're, we're not that young. I mean, we're, right. we're both. That's important. Yeah. And in terms of how quickly it'll affect the body very much depends on one's age. And yes. so in that sense, both of us able to go in, spend time there and, okay, if it's going to kill me in 30 years, fine. Something else probably will too. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if we're our students, I'd be saying don't go. Right. Aiko, in your book, you write that it is not only a body that moves, but everything else too. Our mind flutters and thoughts gush. A virus spreads, a flower blooms and withers. A thing is built and broken. We get deeply moved by a story, visible growth of a child or an artwork. We also get bored and yawn, movements of a body and a mind. A social movement swells, dwindles, and reignites. The Manhattan Project and the development of nuclear technologies, as well as anti-nuclear activism, are also movements. In recent years, we have been moving for Black Lives Matter. So this is a very sort of expansive conception of movement, but um, you have also been a movement-based um, performance artist um, since the 70s, um, and you've also written a manifesto on movement itself. Yes. So I'm sort of wondering so could, if you could tell us a little bit about your history as an artist and how that sort of shaped your understanding of, of movement. I have always liked to be moved, you know, and moved meaning really like, oh, you know, it's so touching. Oh, it really shakes my feeling. Oh, I understand something now with what somebody said. You know, there's a kind of click in your own mind. Or there would be learning in a way that has not, I planned and scheduled myself, right? So uh, I really come from both very literary mind of a bookworm as a child and also my memories of like walking into the mountains and all of a sudden you see this color much more vividly too. Also I've seen post-war Japan really changing the street, the life. You know, I, my generation in Japan, we didn't have a plastic in our lives. Mm. You know, we would go out with a shopping bag, you know, I mean, they were, I mean, when I buy little noodle in a festival, they, they, they were wrapped into the newspaper. Right, so it actually smelled the newspaper's ink. 
So how, so I, I literally, my generation had seen the very big change within the society. When I was in a junior high school, the Tokyo Olympic happened. So up to that year, you know, we, I see so many change of the street scenes and the buildings and the houses, they were kind of taken down, uh, lots of violence in a way from the, from the society. So I've seen all those things throughout my life, which I'm pretty sure I'm not alone at any of your countries, any of your age generation, people grow up, grew up seeing the changes and it affects the way you see your life, right? If your grandma dies, you see the dead body. And you're looking at the dead body thinking, what has changed in this person, mm. right? So I'm, I've been kind of thinking all my life, number one. Number two, when I was got really uh, disturbed and discouraged by a very active political movement I was a part of when I was very young, I moved into dance because I kind of thought this is my bottom line, my body, right? Not even costume, I used to dance naked for many pieces. So that's a very uncapitalistic way of presenting yourself. You know, it's not a fancy thing, fancy anything. But within that, I got hit a little wall when people look at my work and going like, that's not dance. And I, I understood why they are saying it because so many dancers have trained themselves. They put a lot of mind, time and money into creating their own sense of dance. And it's not my, for me to say, no, what I do is dance. No, 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 that's, that's not fruitful. That conversation is not fruitful. I, have, I don't live my life to, dis, to define what dance as an art form is. So instead I go, well, I take your words. It's, it's totally okay for me that you say my work is not dance. It really probably is not, but I do the movement work, okay? So I don't make a big lecture. Sometimes now I do, but very rarely. And my work is to both observe, be aware, and create also movement. And I do the create this movement, like to hit you, or I can create a movement that moves very slowly and let you observe, you know, what happens to this. And in that observation, your mind is working, your mind is moving. And that's enough for me to feel, I don't really have to do much if I have a very attentive, mind either from the computer or either i mean i'm very grateful to have this little group of the people that we are conversing and hoping that we are exchanging of our gaze and the mind and that's to me is a movement so that's where i come from and i often tell to my student you know when something else is moving if you also try to move very much you're kind of missing the sense of inter-exchange. You're not opening your pulse. Whereas if something is moving very, very fast by observing, you are actually accepting and learning from what you're seeing. So to me, I work very differently from dance dance <laughs> in a way of your body is always moving. I feel like I can, I can go between. I can be in and out of that. I guess I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's what I can talk. But but Beneko, you're also being awfully modest there in a sense, because I, you know, let's face it, the dance world has really given you so many honors and so that's much, true. so very, many very mentions. Nice. Yeah. And so I, what I see you have done is you've brought movement in this broad sense to the dance world mm. in a certain way. And again, I'm not alone. You know, there are no. always people. Like for example, my, I admire a, a, a dance artist uh, whose name is Anne Harping. She died of this year with the age 100. And you know, she's a very different kind of artist. But you know, when AIDS epidemic time, AIDS pandemic time really, um, that she was really working with those patients, right? Who had absolutely no knowledge yet to grab, to assess their lifespans yet. Yeah. And you know she she sees uh, all the you know all the us and uh, global warming. She also create a massive prayer rituals, right? So it's not about what only you can do with your body. You, you can kind of think about it how our body is also a part of the larger world, and how we actually can exchange, you know, in our view, somebody who can gaze, 
somebody who can also be willing to be seen. And I do present my body pretty fearlessly for that reason, because I love being seen in a way that somebody's mind opens up in seeing. And, and there is absolutely right. My community, the dance world, downtown dance world, are not conventional dance world, has been extremely kind, accepting, you know, both Ekan Koma and myself as a soloist. So I work with many wonderful, wonderful artists that I respect so highly. And again, that's a movement. And when I'm moved by somebody else's work, by moved by somebody else's career, the, the single-mindedness or very versatile mind, I am very much enriched and I can kind of work on my own in relationship to. I found your description of, I wish I'd remembered exactly what you said, but a, a huge motorbike went by. Your description of, um, I found that all I had at one, forgive my paraphrasing, all I had at one stage was myself, I returned to my body to myself to express myself. You yeah. put it way more beautifully than that. But I can't, <laughs> I can't remember how you put it. I kind of said it's a core, you know, when, yeah. well, let's say I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't really feel I have a, I have an existential core base yet to write, which is I constantly find it when I'm teaching, you know, to the same generation, what I used to say, what I just said, right? When you are 20, you grew up seeing the people who is older than you. You know, you have a perspective of seeing their life with a history and some knowledge, right? But you're constantly feeling like, I don't have it yet. What's, mm. what's my core, right? Mm. And when you're hitting this, uh, so like a, a political deadlock, you start to feeling like, like I need to grab something that, that is more tangible, right? Mm. Than just a theoretical mm. base. And to me, that is when I questioned myself why I am just using so much words when I'm drinking Coca-Cola. Why I am drinking Coca-Cola is connecting to my high. Could I do this, stopping this all the intake? You know, the theory, Coca-Cola, everything else, much harder drinks too. And just really realize, just be there. And this is where my movement work started with, is like two people as a minimum of the group, right? Because I'm alone, I couldn't do anything alone. I got another person kind of feeling the same way. So we had a minimum group that can then be an activism, right? But activism without a theory yet. At this point in my life, I have a certain theories, I have a certain understanding that I rely on, but not when I was 20 years old. So I think it's an ongoing commitment to some of the things that I found on my own mm -hmm. alongside of that. It, al it almost feels, and forgive me if I, I've got this so wrong, but it almost feels for you that courage and the courage to live your life starts with an embodiment of your very own body and your very own space in the world. So a kind of a kind of inner courage becoming an embodied body courage. And, and you start there as a kind of way to be courageous in the world, which would which would be. Uh, actually, you say, you know, you say it doesn't have a theory yet, but that's kind of perfectly modern at the moment because there's this huge explosion of um, uh, movement therapy in Europe. Um, and I almost regret not sharing this talk on, on one of those groups on Facebook, actually, because they would find it so amazing. Um, but that kind of um, this new um, idea of embodied therapy and the embodied self is even becoming so big in Europe that it's now becoming a form of quite respected therapy in English, the National Health Service. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I'm um, going to begin studying creative therapy, art therapy in September. And one of the um, up and coming courses in September in the UK, a lot of, a lot, well, it's only, it's only five now, but one, another one is movement therapy. Mm, that's and, very Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I associate with that myself because many of my students or the people who studied with me, participants of my workshops, had a lot of history with a different way of therapy. 
Mm -hmm. I don't claim myself, I know that much, yet what I associate with you, <laughs> you know, when we are, when any of you, myself included, are really uh, invested in a social political movement, mm -hmm. comes from the firm belief of justice. But then at one point, when you realize your body is kind of forgetting mm -hmm. the yeah. sense of um, yeah. understanding how much of the danger you are, how much you are forgetting your own protection system. Mm. You know? And it's, I mean, like even when I was in Fukushima, I caught myself, I wanted to do more. So it's like we get into this momentum, you know, and sometimes momentum is so, so sensual in a way, yeah. pushes you beyond your own original safety. Mm. Yes instinct you know and i have to see that myself being it's like i'm no different than other people who tend to get too excited sometimes with a movement with the people shouting mm -hmm. with the people pushing you right so like i'm also trying to practice my own curation how much i'm going along to run certain distance but then would i be able to stop it yeah. and think on my own Mm. Or even not think by words, but kind of really literally understanding where I am. It yeah, so I'm great, great courage to put your body in that space. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean I would refuse to go along with a march. It's really kind of a case by case, you know, how, where you are at with that mm. movement, right? And how is your connection to your fellow, mm. fellow around you? Thank you. It's a constant, you know, constant kind of measurement. And kind of decision making. Yeah, I suppose in some ways when we think of dance, sometimes people think of learning certain steps. And it seems like with your work, it's much more about getting having a particular mindset or a way of approaching it sort of internally. And I, I guess that's how I would it's almost a, it's more about a mindset. Well, also, you know, like I, I probably maybe Bill will correct me. I tend to think no nuclear plant has ever been built without some kind of objection. So then the idea is how come that so many uh, nuclear plants have been built? Yeah, the money, uh, yeah, the deception, but the movement was never strong enough. So why is that? Why, why are we, why are we not able to stop something that is so apparently <laughs> dangerous and so apparently causing the environmental disaster rather than only to the humans, right? So this is, this is a question. It's, it's a collective question as humans. So are we maybe destroying ourselves, which kind of makes sense because humanity will not last forever, but are we doing this very fast? Are we doing this in a way that we are taking other world, you know, other lives with us? So I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand this myself. Just um, about the, the arrangement of the images, was that um, pre um, sort of organised? Did you organise that before you went there or was it all quite spontaneous with the costume? Did you know the backdrop uh, that you'd have and the pose you'd have? Did you have anything in mind before you went there or was it all what spontaneously came out when you were there with the posing and the clothes and the and the, the scene? Well, the... the the costuming, so to speak, I mean, Eiko can speak to that, and it, it's a wonderful story, but with regard to the rest of it, um, it was just very much a matter of encountering the places, and um, for me, just allowing Eiko to, to perform, to, to engage through movement in those places, um, and, you know, the, the other part, I mean, for me, is a lot of the work photographically that I did before working closely with Eiko was landscape. Um, and so I'm always looking at landscapes, seeing compositions. Um, and so that's just part of the way I see the world. And that, of course, is what's happening when, when you know, it goes in front of the camera as well. Then. Um, but do you want to say more about the costumes there? I mean, well, I think it, it did help me that, that I was there in 2011, mm. right? So I had no purpose being there except being there. So I had a I had a feeling about that place when I returned. So when I first time, you know, I packed, you know, because we weren't going by car all the way. We had to take a train to the place where we could take a train and then get a car. So I was limited to what I could bring. You know, usually like one big suitcase. 
that I can drag to. So what what do you put it in, right? And I was actually seeing that a color. I would put the color. So and I I remember thinking, not only the people who fled and forced to fled, but the people who died there long time ago. So they are you know they are. I'm not so much as a religious person, but I, I, could, I could feel the lingering, some kind of a atmosphere, you know, that many people had lived there and died there. So it's their ancestry, right? And I kind of felt like, oh, their colors. Many journalists talk about the people who fled, they are being interviewed, but they were not really hearing from the people who already had died there before nuclear problems. So to me, as I was bringing Kara, I was actually bringing my grandma's clothing because that's what I had. And it didn't feel right for me to like just, you know, put the fabric and put myself. No, I didn't do that. I only brought from what I already owned, picking up the kind of colors. Either I was missing because it was so dusty after tsunami, Right? It was everything was covered by this humongous, you know, things, right? Or I kind of brought it that I, what I called kimono kara, because nowadays clothing had a very different color tone than kimono wearing culture. So even the people there, of course, had a more working clothes, you know, when they work. But I kind of see that as a kind of like, the people who died and when their like spirit was remaining or some kind of a way that lingering um, sense that they used to be there, I thought I would also bring something that is beyond my own lifetime. And I wanted to wear something that can correspond. So I arrived to the place and then I usually I'm picking up the color to add to that scape. Mm. Right. So that was, and then like by 2019, I was clearly feeling like, oh gosh, the place already that it erased that lingering from the, the people who died. Like, like there's some systematic alteration of the place, not just being destroyed. Yes, tsunami destroyed it and people had to flee. It. But there's some sense of the government and this, this construction had really came to the point where like, it's a new landscape. And I stopped wearing the kimono almost all together and began to wear what I have from regular clothes. Because at that point, I couldn't really look into the past. There was not the atmosphere that can connect me to the past. Right, so if you look through the book, you'll see, you know, it starts with a lot of the images that include Eiko's grandmother's um, futon, the red there in particular, I mean, she's got a wonderful little essay in the book um, about the, the red actually having been underclothing for her grandmothers. Um, and, you know, so it's bringing this past into the present. And once in a while, I would actually say, Eiko, what, what about using the yellow or the red or the yeah, green yeah, or whatever suggest, too? Right, yeah. um, for the most part, it was completely separate. And also everything I did was improvised but not improvised in a way you would think a dancer improvising in a studio. I was improvising, feeding the place. Mm. And kind of like seeing myself, I was always very aware sometimes what's my background. Because as a performer, depending on how I place myself, I have a power to choose the background and that will be in a picture, right? Mm. But sometimes I get so wrapped up with feeling and, and, and in the, either the upset or sadness, I'm not particularly framing myself to the camera. I had to trust Bill that he would do that on his own. Mm -hmm. So I could kind of imagine the frame, but not really posing into a frame, which I don't think I ever did. All right. Um, I was just wanted one other question as well. Um, I haven't seen the book, but Bradley's saying that, um, actually, I've lost you. But Bradley's saying that you've um, used a quote by Mark Block at the beginning of it. The oh, this, this is a different book, but yeah. Oh, is it the same book? Yeah, there's a, there's a different book. That, um, oh, it's a different book. Okay, um, I, I thought it was this book. There was a quote. Yeah. Well, actually, I've got, I've got a, a quote. It, it, it fits in with the question I was going to ask next. So maybe what I'll do is I'll ask that question and then you can ask about Mark Block as well, if you want. Um, just because Iona um, is working on Mark Block, so that's... Uh, 
might actually feed in as well. But um, yeah, so Bill, in your preface to your 1995 book, The Modern Epidemic, A History of Tuberculosis in Japan, you say that the book shows that epidemics are far more than objectively measurable biological events or episodes of importance to medical scientists. They are also political events in which the strings of power determine how a society responds to a widespread threat to health. And they are cultural events that reflect a society's deeply held values and beliefs. I feel compelled to say something similar about a body in Fukushima. Although you are using photography rather than the written word, the images and the awareness you bring to them are multi-layered. They aren't simply documents of the land, the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear meltdown, nor are they simply dances. They seem to capture political and cultural events. Towards the end of A Body in Fukushima, you also talk about the relationship between long and short disasters and the distinction between the natural and the human. And I get the impression that your experience as a historian has really informed how you're engaging in and thinking about this project. How do you feel that your experience as a historian has framed and shaped your involvement in this project? Um, I'm, first of all, I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm really delighted to see you, you know, dip back to the modern epidemic, which um, at the time I wrote that, I mean, not many people were writing about history of disease and epidemics in medicine from really a historical perspective. I and mean, even when I got started, people would say, how can you do that? Are you a physician? You have to be a physician to do this kind of thing. It's sort of like, no, you don't. Um, that's not what it's about. It's, it's, it's about something much larger and much different. And, and of course, I owe my, one of my mentors, a woman named Barbara Rosencrantz, um, who really opened my eyes up to this. I mean, she was looking at the history of tuberculosis in the United States. Um, and I realized nobody had done that with Japan. Um, but then you know, the that exact sentence that you got, I mean, that's the one which resonates, you know, from what we're living through right now, is how we're seeing how COVID is revealing our, our deepest held cultural values um, in many ways. And, you know, other epidemics have done that. But at the same time, I, I'm really delighted that you you, you went and, and sprung from there to the Fukushima work. Um, and, and you're spot on. Um, because again, when I, I would shoot landscape photography, and I'm sorry, I don't have some examples I could be showing you right off here. And, and I do need to put more, I do have a website, which is William Johnston Photography. Um, and I, I haven't done much with that for like a year or so. And I, I need to get back on there, put more images up, uh, both more recent and, for, and further past. But I would look at landscapes, you know, I, I grew up in um, uh, Wyoming in the United States, and, and that's about as in the, in the countryside as you can get in this country. I mean, the, the state I live in, um, grew up in, is about the same size as Honshu in Japan in, in, in ter territory, and it had about 300,000 people in it. So I mean, it's just hardly any people in this huge expanse. But at the same time, I, I learned to look at this expanse and what looked like open spaces as a historical palimpsest. That, that there were you know, things there which humans had made their marks on the land through their habits, through their, their monuments, et cetera. Um, and th that the landscape spoke of this. And that you know, through, through looking at landscape, through cityscapes, whatever it is our surroundings are, um, there's so many things that speak to us. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of my landscape works has no, no human bodies as such. Um, but it's full of people in my thinking because it's full of what people have done to leave their marks on this. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's how I, I did approach um, uh, Fukushima. And, and it's simply because for the most part, there wasn't hardly anybody there when we got there the first time. Yes. Um, and so it was this open landscape. And you know, it was funny because the, uh, when we came back from Fukushima for our first trip in January of 2014, it goes like, hey, we've got to go see Hayashi Kyoko. We've got to go see her. And I'm like, hey, we're springing in on her here. Is this fair? And she's like, no, don't worry, we'll do it. And so we showed her some of the landscapes from this first shoot that we'd done. We, neither of us had showered or anything from that last day of work or anything. We're pretty grubby. Um, and she looked at the landscapes or these images and she said, 
oh, these are, are landscapes, which because echo is in them, I see so much more. And for me, that just really hit the spirit of, of the work in a larger sense. I mean, that, that echo is, is bringing out something which is happening in this landscape, which is a palimpsest of, you know, as Aiko mentioned earlier, I mean, and, and why people want to go back. I mean, it's, it's a sense that Americans, for the most part, we don't have because we don't have the sense of ancestors. My, my fifth generation, you know, five generations ago, they lived in this village. You know, this is my family's village. Well, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people take that for granted in a sense, of course, I've got my village and of course, I'm going to be able to go back. But then suddenly nuclear accident says, no, you can't. And the kind of jarring, you know, the, the shock to, to bodies that happens just with that, um, I think was something that, that I just sort of instinctually felt and wanted to record visually as much as possible. And then all the other ways in which, you know, the, the tsunami, and then as Eiko pointed out, as time has gone on, they've created, you know, these seawalls. I mean, they've just transformed the landscape with concrete and, and civil engineering projects um, in ways that create vast amounts of money for the people involved and are just destroying this, this environment. Um, and for me, it's, it's very much a, a kind of, of parable for, for in, in many ways, the way the world has gone. Um, but, you know, I could go on. I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, seeing the, uh, the images is multi-layered. I was really happy that one of the images you poked, picked out and were showing earlier was where you're looking down that staircase and it goes at the bottom on the platform on the, the station. And you have all of those many, many reflections in, in many places um, that you're looking into that. And it's that, you know, that's a literal, uh, you know, uh, reflection there of, of the kind of multi-layered um, dimensions that I'm trying to bring out with the images. Um, so thank you for asking that. Other comments or, or questions that others might have as well, you know, on, on this theme. Yeah, just just from what you said, because um, I was interested in Mark Block, and um, you said you had mm. a quote at the beginning of that book on, on Mark Block, and just for what you were saying about um, looking um, at the landscapes and looking at the marks, uh, you know, and the, the record of the landscapes of, of, of people and of things gone by, and I think that's a very first and Arnie's type and a Mark Block type tenet, really, of looking for mm. history, you know, and a very original approach to it, actually, as well, so that's... Fascinating. You know, I'd, I'd forgotten I did put Mark Block in here, but but that's also a, a very good observation. I mean, that, that what we're looking at is very much, you know, the Annals School. I love what they do. And, and this sort of, you know, layering of, of, you know, so many different everyday practices, for example, um, that create the landscapes in, in, that we inhabit. Fascinating. It's interesting how you've, you've sort of transformed that into a visual essay and, and movement and dance as well and sort of incorporated that into it. And, and more recently, I mean, the one um, work which I found a real inspiration was Jean-Luc Nancy's um, After Fukushima, um, which is, um, it's, it's translated under that title in English. I can't remember the French title immediately, um, but that's also a, a wonderful book in terms of thinking about uh, how, you know, yeah, the connectivity, the connectedness of all things. I mean, why the, 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 this idea of natural disaster is, is, is completely a, a kind of misuse of categories. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I did put a lot of my own time and effort and mind to this, and the, you know, to the degree that my body also in a radiation place, is because it gave me such a sense of locality, which is not at all only local. Right, so like looking at some specific place and seeing universality, you know, I'm, I'm literally looking, okay, I have to look at this one now in front of me because that connects to all the other possible disasters waiting to happen. Mm. And, and, and that motivated me. It wasn't like I'm just trying to be curiosity, you know, poking around because I do see this can happen anyway. Yeah, I also really liked what you were saying, Bill, about the, in the book, you stood, you'd make this distinction between long and short disasters mm. and also about the human and nature and how those distinctions kind of break down when we talk about these kind of, these kind of things. Yeah, so I mean, the idea that, that uh, you know, came to mind was, you know, disasters fast and slow. And, and it comes from, uh, there's a book uh, called, um, uh, gosh, all of a sudden I'm, I'm forgetting it. Um, 
Uh, no, it's not Scott Gabriel Knowles. It's it's Rob Nixon's um, okay. Slow Violence. Right. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So Slow Violence by Rob Nixon. Um, and he's actually a, a more of a, a literary scholar, um, but he's very much environmentally minded. And he's looking at issues of environmental justice and how um, looking at, you know, in particular public health issues, and this is where the nuclear really comes in, uh, you can have these public health issues, which are actually doing violence to people in ways that are as terrible as, let's say, you know, what happens in, 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 a, in a, a, you know, a very rapidly happening accident, a train accident, car accident, plane accident, whatever, um, which are, are fast violence, so to speak, or, or literally warfare, of course, or other forms of fast violence. But the, with, with slow violence, you can have a purposeful perpetration of violence on human bodies, which you know, often comes from neglect. I mean, the kind of issues that Aiko was referring to a minute ago. Um, but then if we take that and, and transfer it from um, uh, slow violence to slow disasters, and that there are some disasters which are very rapid in unfolding. So, you know, again, a building collapsing, sure, that's, that's a disaster and it's a very rapidly happening one over a matter of, of seconds or minutes at the most, perhaps. Whereas, you know, you can have slow disasters. And I, I thought I thought of this, but then I started doing a little, you know, search, did searches on, on the internet and all of a sudden somebody named Scott Gabriel Knowles had already developed the same language. I mean, he uses the words um, fast and slow disasters. Um, and um, he's also a, a scholar. Uh, he's also a historian, though, an environmental uh, a historian. Um, and uh, we, we haven't really exchanged too many ideas on that, but I, I really admired his work and I do refer to it. Um, so to me, it, it's when more than one person has the same idea at the same time means that maybe it has some value to it. Um, and also, that's basically you are saying from both ends, right? Because hmm. something really dramatic happens in front of your eye or on the newspaper within you know, five days of reading, right? But there's a history to get to that, right? So when we teach, we really go back all the way of scientific history, right? So from the nuclear fission, right? Even from that, before that, how one could imagine a fission, right? Before it could even get to the practicality, right? But now for somebody like Hayashi, who, for whom at age 14, all the sudden things never imagined happened with this brightest light and the brightest, you know, just loud sound and everything was completely sudden, right? Yet, even after the acute, um, um, acute radiation sickness, mm. you overcome. There is already intake room, very small amount of mm. the radiation that residing in your body that continues. That itself is not a big deal if you end up dying the next year for some other reason. But if you survive, that smallest dose of radiation continue to affect into your body, which resulting 40, 50 years later, much more ratio of the ca our cancer compared to other say, same age group, right? So this really is both in a way have the slow and the fast is relating and it never is a clean cut. It, it is from the slow system that something drastic happens because it's been prepared to happen. And then once you kind of felt like, oh, you overcome it, it doesn't end there. And it continues uh, in many different ways in different system, in a different body system too. Right. And that is right. that is quite bewildering and learning, very humbling at the same time as if you really look at it, even more anger or more upset can can be your own thoughts. Because you see it didn't end. It doesn't end, right? It doesn't. Yeah, yeah when, when we taught the courses on Japan and the atomic bomb, and, and then we later developed that into something called Japan's nuclear disasters. So we included Fukushima. Um, I mean, we'd start with the 19th century and the early thinking about nuclear physics and then what possibilities of, you know, um, creating this, this fantastic source of energy. And there's, there was a physicist named Frederick Soddy, I believe is at Cambridge, um, yes. who, uh, um, you know, developed a lot of the ideas, you know, coming out of radium. And then H.G. Wells right. read that and, and he wrote a book called The World Set Free, and, which isn't one of his more famous works, but it's fascinating. I, I urge you to take a look at that um, because a lot of what he's saying in there, so he publishes this in, in um, 
August 1914, so just before World War I starts, literally months. And he has this world war that occurs and ends through nuclear bombing. Um, and then, then he has the world go to another step in which is this idealistic you know, world government, which it kind of makes everything okay. Um, but, you know, we haven't gotten there yet, uh, but, but a lot of what he foresaw is, is, you know, already he's foreseeing in 1914 things that actually then took place 30 years later in 1944, um, you know, and then, you know, it takes us right down to where we are now. So, but what I love about what Eiko is doing is it's, you know, the human body, we ourselves, this thing is also a manifestation of this history. And the more we understand about it, the better, but then we also need to come to terms with it in all the other emotional and other ways that we need to. What exactly were you sort of teaching on the course on the atomic bomb? How did that sort of develop? And yeah, well, it, it um, sort of came out of a uh, history of science approach um, in the first part of it. But the thing that I was never happy with that, which was sort of my approach in many ways, um, until I got to know Echo better, was how best to integrate um, the experiences of the bombed in particular through their own voices. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's like what you raise uh, about the other issue of, of seeming multi-layered and, and is telling the story of the atomic bombings and then just of nuclear energy and the accidents that have occurred with it um, as multi-layered realities that, that inter intersect the, the history of science, but yet at the same time, political history, military history, the history of imperialism, the history of capitalism, um, all of these things weaving together and then you have these very, at times, just, I mean, I, I still read them and I, I come to tears. I mean, the stories of the people who experienced the atomic bombings in particular in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, I think, you know, we don't want to make this a sentimental journey, right. you know, in the historical learning yet, you know, like even like how, what kind of sound the atomic bomb had been when it exploded, right? But there are, the scientific notation or the, 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 the volume of the sound measured by so and so or by such and such does not really tell you what it is really like for the people to hear it. And then some people claim they never heard it mm. because they were in such a shock, right? And of course, we have to think about what's in the epicenter, people disappeared before they could even hear it because sound comes later, right, than the light. Right. So in a way, so their bodies were vaporized. Right. So yes, the vaporization happened before even sound can be recognized. You know, I mean, this is all kind of. But point I was trying to make is, no one person's witness account can give you any entry. But when you read five, six, or different ways how it has been remembered, even by you know a child versus grown up. Then we begin to sort of feel there's an entry point for our imagination. So if it's just the numbers and science, it is very hard to the knowledge really size your body. But when you hear it from other people's, you know, and it has to be a really trained voice, not only just a witness voice. I think the mix of the both really gives our student an entry point. And I, for me, I'm not an academic person. To me, like, okay, if I don't remember, the you know, next day, what's the point of learning about it? So how do I remember that? And the remembrance really comes from this hitch, you know, where you actually go something to cling on to, right? And that this is what I'm trying to offer, either by a movement class, mm -hmm. by bringing atomic bomb literature, by having the interview, just by having a one photo of the, you know, of the Nagasaki, rather than just a, a pure history of it, right? And I think that the whole academic field is really begin to understand this mm -hmm. because otherwise it does it does not affect the democracy where we are in a democracy we need a knowledge that actually moves our body either the voting or the movement or saying no the knowledge alone does not affect back to the, the society it's like what you were saying earlier about being moved yeah. and something moving you it, it, it's very much like a lot of these things, they might not necessarily always be, they might not be able to, they might not simply be about intellectually telling the whole story, that they're somehow about to be these very personal moments that, that can move also the people that are 
except for the students that are studying this and stuff. Yeah, I mean, at certain point, you need a gut to kind of place yourself, you know, to somewhere mm -hmm. else. Like, how can you feel yourself? How do you trust yourself? Mm -hmm. Your knowledge is actually creating your self curation, so mm -hmm. your own decision making, right? And how we are not detached from what's going on. England, too, America, too, Japan, too. Many places we look, democracy is really not working the way that we had we had uh, we had wished to work and I think I think that's a bottom line on my sense of working and teaching is like how do we actually create a knowledge that you can use and you can remember and your action is based on that knowledge and how that knowledge can connect to your own understanding of yourself and your own body and the own and the space that you hold yourself. Yeah, we all hold a space, don't we, around ourselves and right. And that way, you actually create more knowledge too, because you absorb more knowledge because you are putting your body in a place of... in a space. Yeah, it's it's so funny. I had this conversation recently. What you just said, Echo, about putting your body in a space. I had this conversation recently. Um, with an older friend of mine in her late 50s and she said you know it's so funny with social media because people from the age of 15 to, to 30 who may be struggling with really serious problems in the I'm speaking probably mostly about Western Europe and America they may be struggling with really personal serious well actually Japan too I think may be struggling with really serious problems like mental illness or uh, or they don't like their town, or they're really struggling with their upbringing or their parents, but they can go online and they can talk about that and they can find groups and they can find people. What they never actually have to do is move their very physical form to another place <laughs> in order to escape those problems, which is what we all had to do before the year 2000, um, 2005. And it's so funny. So I'm so interested in this idea of the how much of yourself you put within your body and how much of, of the, you know, the, between your mind mm -hmm. and your body and society, there's an in-between place and how, and how you express that in the world, where you move yourself, how you form yourself, whether you dance, how you express yourself, how you protect yourself from others, what space you put there, what boundaries. And that's why I'm, I, I absolutely love the idea of expressive dance photography and expressive dance po um, politics, embodied politics. Well, thank you. And also, you know, I've been working online, right? Teaching online, you know, yeah. creating online, distributing online. So mm. the book is not online. Yeah. Once, I hope, you know, we meet here yeah. in a small group. You know, it's available in England, I'm pretty sure through the online uh, purchase. But once you get a book, I'm with you in your home. Mm. But not but, by Amazon. Right. <laughs> Go well, to a bookstore. Whatever you <laughs> choose. Yes. You know, at that point, I'm with you. You may have gotten me through the Amazon, but I'm with you. <laughs> and in a way that, you know, and it's a big book, actually, you know, and it's a heavy book. And it, it sits there. My hope is that, oh, Elephant Bill is there. You know, it's in their home, it's in your home. And mm. somehow maybe it will be a beginning of letter writing. It will be a beginning of, oh, New York, everybody lives in New York. You know, I mean, just mm. it's a way we can make our imagination much more rooted than our own ge geography rather than just internet space. Because yeah. this one is a very particular geography. And if I can be a little bit of liaison between your geography, where you're about, mm you know, to where the Fukushima is, and you probably have a much closer place that you can imagine something could happen that is absolutely scary for yourself. And also that I can, I buy a book, an actual book, and I can give that as an actual gift, you know, um, rather than a, a link on. Can touch it. Keep it in yeah. circulation. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, I try, but I'm, you know, I'm 30 going on 85. Because <laughs> I'm an artist, so that's an interesting thing as well, as in you're taking your imagination and you're, and you're putting it on physical paper. And making, making prints of art feels like gifts.
but I have had people approach me and say, oh, have you heard of NFTs? You could, you could sell your art. I don't know if you guys have heard of NFTs. It's the whole new thing. I mean, you probably have been approached with those photo uh, photographs, I go, and like, it's a whole new thing, you know. Oh, it's, it's a digital certificate where people sell for thousands and thousands. Oh yeah, no, I, I know the idea. You're gonna Google it now, Bill. <laughs> You're like, I'll earn some money. <laughs> well, we shall see, dude. You know, putting the uh, photo book was already a first effort for us to make something yeah. tangible. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Oh, I mean, we did uh, many exhibitions actually, which I hope we can continue. Well, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much into the print as a physical object. Oh, he so. prints himself. It's all the mm. photo. So that's. Oh, some... that's lovely. Yeah. 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 So we're very so. much hand on, you know, body on, hand on people. Yeah. Mm. So one of the things I loved was the way that Aiko um, refers to the project not as a solo project, but as a duet. And I think that's really beautiful. A sort of really beautiful reminder that photography is always in some ways part of the dance. Yeah. Um, so how did this um, duet play out for both of you? Well, it is what it is. You see it, you know. I mean, I would not have done this without him, without his camera. Even if he was there, if he didn't have a camera, I would not have done that because then his body is not a uh, conduit to other people's eyes. So his camera is a conduit, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm, I was very aware that this, this performance, you know, maybe we take out of 800 picture, like one picture, right? So everything kind of moves into that. At the same time, I can still present myself. I was there. I was in that place. So it, that doesn't translate only to that one picture. It's more like my body memory of like remembering that place, mm. right? So that when I look at the map, the map is not at all even space. There is a dot of the places I have been, right? And my memories. And sometimes photograph helps even to refresh my memories. Even that photograph, we didn't deem it amazing and to send it to the people. So it's a constant way of self-curation of, I create, I share, but that sharing object does also remind me what was important to me. And I bow to remember, but I need also help to remember. And to me, like, you know, okay, until I die, I'm trying to keep selecting what I want to remember and what I want to share with others. So in that, I'm very much a performer. I try to be in a place with a slight hope of to share eventually. And that was why for me to put my body work. That's something you had said, Eiko, about, you know, with this project that you'd always taken it for granted that you, you, you do a performance and it's gone forever. Yeah. And whereas with this, it's not. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a time and space machine, this little camera thing. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So I'm still like trying to find, you know, but any human inventions as both pros and cons. But this little thing, this little thing called the camera, it's something I am making uh, friends that I don't cater, I don't flatter. It's something there. And, you know, Bill brings it with him. And it, it is kind of supporting, you know, like how I support it this atomic bomb victim, it's Hayashi's life in data life. When I tell her what my student is reading and how she's reacting, that supported her life. Mm. Much in the same way, by him being there for me, but also being using his talent and his commitment to share the work with you, is actually supporting me continuing this practice. Right. It's not an um, objective. But it is the base of my assumption of how I will continue to practice. Well, and, and you know, Eiko, what you've taught me about the whole project and what, the way I've felt about it is it's, it's a collaboration, you know, and, and I think of it, it, it a lot like music that way. And, you know, I'm, I'm a jazz lover and, and, you know, I like a lot of the classical jazz. You know, I, I love Thelonious Monk. I mean, going back to the issues of rhythm and time and space. I mean, the way he just like, dan, 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 dan. dan done you know it's like where's he going with this and all of a sudden you figure it out and then then he steps in and he's got like um uh uh, uh 
you know, on, on Art Blakey on drums then who comes in and then redefines space in yet another way for both of them, for the time I should say. And, and it, it's sort of like that with both of us that, that what we're getting is, is, is in a way a lot more than either one of us could ever produce. You know, it's, it's, it, it's a collaboration, it's a duet, but it's a collaboration that's, that's creating something that otherwise, you know, we, we just wouldn't be able to do. So I suppose it's an improvisational duet. Yeah, yeah which is why I also make the jazz associations yeah. as, as opposed to, let's say, uh, you know, as much as I love string quartets, for example, I mean, not too many of them are improvisational, although mm -hmm. some are. Yeah. But you know, the, the improvisational, yes, it is at the, at, the, at the start of it, but there's always a selecting process. Right. So that is a curation process, right? So in a way, the choreography is done by selecting. Mm rather than at the beginning. Yes, well, so the play it, itself, for example. Yeah, I, I was amused. I mean, somebody writing about this, they said, well, we went to Fukushima and took 200 photographs. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, we went to Fukushima, we took 25,000 photographs. And that is not an exaggeration. I counted them up. No like way. That. Yeah, it's 25,000 and change. No. <laughs> so that's, it's the editing out of that. And, and a lot of the editing, I mean, another way in which the collaborative project worked was, you know, we would shoot during the day and then we would have a meal and then sit down with the computer. It would, it would download while we're eating. We would sit down with the images and go through the images um, and say, you know, we like this, don't like that a lot of the time. But it also then informed what Eiko would be doing and what I would be doing as well uh, the next day. So, I mean, it was this, 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 this ongoing. And then after that is a lot more um, editing as well. Uh, but you know that's that's kind of the process as we went through it. That would be yeah. a wonderful animation, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't it though? You know, what I mean? yeah, I think it'd be fun. I do, you know when you you talked about Hiroshima and I wondered if you guys had seen Grave of the Firefly. Oh yeah, isn't that oh, yeah. beautiful? I'm yeah. I'm gonna Hayao Miyazaki. Please forgive my pronunciation, Aiko. Mi Miyazaki, Miyazaki Hayao Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah. I. I remember watching that in film school when I was a teenager, and I found the fact that he'd used animation almost more powerful than. Mm -hmm. But if um, you read the original story, yeah. I would still think that is even much more forgetful, uh, forget, unforgettable. Unforgettable. The original story itself, you know, I'm pretty sure it's translated. Yeah, it is. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's a, and again, you know, we take, we can take not one, but a different way to approach the things, right? And mm -hmm. the bottom line is what happened indeed has happened. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an unforgettable violence. And mm -hmm. therefore, we will telling ourselves we're going to remember this. And, and, artist, and such, sorry. And the artist had put a lot of effort to remember. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 2D animation in the seven was it 70s, 80s? 2D animation then was was very physical and very embodied because it was 24 pictures per second. Right, all those so, cells. Yeah, so I mean, that would have been extremely focused, thought about, known of. Um, you know, now animation is easier because you can you can get a program. In fact, all of us can get a program for 30 pounds a year or whatever. And, and you can just tell the computer to move a certain thing to a certain yeah. space and it doesn't, you know, it'll do this movement quite easy for you, but that's like two seconds, which used to be 48 drawing. So the, the dedication in that animation, I found really beautiful. And also the fact that it was animation and not film, I found beautiful because it, it was, I think for me, it was more haunting because what you said earlier, Aiko, we won't really know the memories because they died. <laughs> they died, you know. Uh, and so I thought that the fact that it was drawing and, and art um, was more applicable to imagination than filming may have been. A, a kind of, you know, in, in film, you've got a space and everything's very organized and you have cameras and you have funding. And, um, and, I, and I thought maybe art was because it's from imagination, not filmed. Of, I thought maybe it was more powerful that way. I also have to go, but I just want to say thank you so much. Thank I have, you too. I have I really have to go too. We have a project today. To, we'll be shooting throughout the night in a graveyard, which is America's second oldest graveyard. Oh, wow. 580,000 bodies. Mm. Of course, I did much more in, in this pandemic. 
So you guys can imagine us shooting throughout the night in a completely dark areas tonight. Oh God, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds terrifying. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think I invite you to my website, which is my full name, ekotake.org. And we have a, I have a whole page about Fushima with the different uh, videos I created from his photographs. Okay. By Thank all you. means, you know, if you get a book and read some of our essays and you have a correspondence ideas, you know, I'm pretty sure Bradley will help us to how to get in touch with us. Okay. That would be one name at the Gmail, so it's pretty easy. Yeah, I'm, I'm just Debbie Johnston at wesleyan.edu. I mean, so it's also very easy to find. Okay. So Thank you so much. Language. Thank you so much. You're, you're a great group. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for joining <laughs> us. Very thank much you. appreciated. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening. This has been the Exploding Appendix podcast. If you like this and you'd like to check out more of our work, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, YouTube, or Twitter. And or check out our website at www.explodingappendix.com. Exploding Appendix, ideas and culture. Yeah.